Hello, my name is Chris Young and I'm one of the park rangers at Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park. Welcome to October the 27th of 1863. Well, actually it's 2020, but we're going to talk about October 27th, 1863 and what happens with what will become the opening of the Cracker Line. So how dangerous is this operation? To the Union soldiers that have no idea what's about to happen, not too bad. But once they begin getting in the boats and embarking on the Tennessee River, it becomes pretty apparent that this is a death-defying and dangerous mission that they're about to undertake. What they're going to do is be opening the supply line into the city of Chattanooga where a beleaguered army on the verge of starvation has been besieged by Confederates on Missionary Ridge and Lookout Mountain for almost an entire month. What you're going to see right now behind me, just to my right, underneath the bridge, that's Market Street Bridge, heading to the triangular rooftops there of the Tennessee Aquarium, just at the base of that is Ross's Landing. Now this is a famous landing, primarily associated with the Ross brothers. You probably know the more famous Ross brother, Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation, John Ross. Now, by the time the Civil War occurs, Cherokee removal unfortunately has happened and Chattanooga has taken its name. On October 27th, this mission is about to occur. At midnight on the 27th, William B. Hazen, a Union general, now, Hazen can be seen here. He's in dark Union General's uniform. He has slicked back hair, and he has what's now considered today a Napoleon III imperial facial hair piece. Um, it's almost like a little goatee there. Hazen has been given the task because of his fighting at Chickamauga, because of his reliability. Um, he's a federal fe fellow Vermonter of uh, Baldy Smith, who is the engineer of this plan. He's given that task. He has 50 pontoon boats and two flat boats that he's going to be using barges. Um, and there will be 1,400 Union soldiers at 12 o'clock midnight that will be awakened, that will be brought down to the river just behind me at Ross's Landing where they'll load pontoon boats, where they'll load those small barges, those boats, um, and they will embark for a place called Brown's Ferry. This is going to be a crossing on the opposite side of the Tennessee River that we'll see in just a little while. There's no bridges in 1863 that span the Tennessee River. What is there, and how we know where Ross's Landing's terminus on the south side, on that side of the river, on my right side of the river is, is we can use park engineer Edward Betts's map that's made in the 1890s. Betts was very particular and meticulous with how he mapped the Civil War um, area. Betts's map, which can be seen here, shows the Flying Ferry, which is anchored on Chattanooga Island and actually will move between the North Bank, where we are, and the South Bank at Ross's Landing on the opposite side of the Tennessee River on the Chattanooga side. So you'll see that on this map that we show here. Those 1,400 men are going to get in the pontoon boats and they're going to disembark from Ross's Landing under the cover of darkness. They will leave at three o'clock in the morning. They get up at midnight, they move down to the river, they get into their boats. Most of them are standing. They're not even uh, able to sit. There's not enough room. And they will use that cover of darkness to shove off on the Tennessee River to Brown's Ferry and they will meander along the Tennessee River under the Confederate cannon on Lookout Mountain using the cover of darkness to mask that flotilla. This is a death-defying feat for those Union soldiers, but they know that everything hangs in the balance. Chattanooga, their survival hangs in the balance of them being successful in this operation. Next, We'll see you at Moccasin Bend along the Browns Ferry Road. The park ranger now stands again on the bank of a wide river. The bank on the opposite side consists of a heavily wooded ridge. In the center, it makes the impression of a saddle as a narrow gap or valley cuts through the ridge. 
Welcome back everyone. We're now standing on the west bank of Moccasin Bend at the terminus of the Browns Ferry Federal Road Trail. So you're more than welcome to come out to Moccasin Bend, hike this trail that is part of Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park. Come out to this point where you see the Tennessee River behind me and just across the river you'll see the terminus of what was Browns Ferry just in the saddle of the ridge behind me off to the, to the right there. On October the 27th, as General Hazen's troops have gotten into the pontoon boats and they're making their way around Moccasin Point to the bend of the river, coming up in this direction to make landfall just across the river behind me, there are Union soldiers that are marching to this point that will be ferried across the river as well. And those troops are under the command of John Turchin. Now, General Turchin can be seen in this photograph in civilian clothing. He has a short beard and he is prematurely balding facing the camera. Turchin's men are marching toward this point and there are additional troops of Hazen's brigade, those men who could not fit in those pontoon boats, about 700 men that are trying to pass Turchin's men to get over here because they will be the first ones as Hazen's men hit the what would be considered beachhead across the river. Those boats will be sent over here to this side. Hazen's troops will get in those boats and be ferried across to help out with the assault. And then General Turchin's men will go across later after them. And then those pontoon boats will be lashed together across the Tennessee River behind me and create a floating bridge that troops can cross as well from the Chattanooga side. So remember, this is a death-defying feat. This is very dangerous for those troops to encounter. It's fairly foggy on the 27th of October. And a little after 4 o'clock in the morning, there's a signal fire on this side of Moccasin Bend that will signal those first boats. Members of the 23rd Kentucky under Colonel Foy will get that signal to move from this side of the Tennessee River, the east side, over to the west side of the Tennessee River. And Foy will actually miss that. General Hazen will be in one of the boats behind him and is yelling at Colonel Foy that he's missed the mark and that he needs to go across the river. And he will. And in the darkness of the morning of October the 27th, in the fog and shrouded gap of the ridge line, which you can see in this photograph, it's a modern day photo that we've taken. You can see the fog coming through the peaks of the ridge in this photograph. They will establish that beachhead. They will hit the ground at Browns Ferry, almost like a wave, those dark soldiers, those dark and shrouded soldiers being masked in their blue uniforms coming up through the fog making that landing, that beachhead across the river at Browns Ferry in that saddle. Our next stop, we're going to be looking at the Confederate perspective as Confederates are awakened suddenly and they try to get reinforcements to the gap to stop that Union onslaught as they open up what would become known as the Cracker Line. We'll see you across the river in just a few minutes. The park ranger again stands on the bank of a wide river. The opposite bank is wooded, and in the distance, some ways, rises Lookout Mountain. Welcome back, everyone. We're standing now on the west side of the Tennessee River, and this is where the terminus of Browns Ferry occurs. You'll see Lookout Mountain over my left shoulder just behind me, the summit of which you can see at the very tip top is Point Park, part of Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park. And now we are down here at Browns Ferry. You'll see the Tennessee River behind me as well over my left shoulder. Let me just preface this by saying that we're now on property that is not public property. This is property that is held in trust and has been preserved by probably many of you through your assistance with the American Battlefield Trust. So just keep in mind where we're filming today is private property, not public property um, held by the National Military Park. But it is very key to the story of the opening of the Cracker Line that occurs in October of 1863. So again, on October the 27th, in the early morning hours, after four o'clock in the morning, Members of the 23rd Kentucky U.S. Infantry standing in those pontoon boats 
and those small barges are going to move from the eastern side of the Tennessee River over here to the western side to the terminus of Brown's Ferry and they're going to create a beachhead where we are right now. And those Union soldiers, just like these waves are lapping up right now from that boat that just passed us, are going to seemingly be coming out of the Tennessee River. Those dark Union soldiers in their blue uniforms are going to make landfall here, move to my left, to your right, up into the saddle of Brown's Ferry, of the ridge line here. There are going to be a few Confederate soldiers that are asleep up here near probably where the ferry keeper's house is going to be located. And we're going to throw up a, a map here that's going to show you where Brown's Ferry is. You'll see a little uh, black square there that's going to be the ferryman's house. This is going to be a map that was produced again by park engineer Edward Betts and we'll show you exactly where we are. You'll see the saddle, the two ridges on either side of where Brown's Ferry is going to be located here. In this gap that we just looked at as we panned the camera over there will be members of the 15th Alabama Infantry. These are soldiers that had fought at Gettysburg. If you're familiar with Little Round Top, this is the, the unit that's going to fight against the 20th Maine there. They're also going to come down with Longstreet's Corps and fight at Chickamauga. They're commanded by future governor of the state of Alabama, William C. Oates. Now Oates can be seen here in Confederate uniform. He is facing slightly to his left. He has a beard and he's wearing a kepi and that is uh, William C. Oates who's going to command the 15th Alabama here. Oates is going to get word that the Union Army, Hazen's men, have made landfall on this side of, of Brown's Ferry. As they move into the ferry gap itself and onto the hillsides on either side of this inlet or this saddle, Oates is going to be awakened. The long roll is going to be beat to call the few companies of the 15th together. And just a few hundred men are going to come up against those 1,400 plus men of Hazen's brigade as they make landfall here and push inward. Oates, through that haze, through the fog, is going to give commands to his men that even though they can't see, their orders are to shove the muzzles of their muskets or their rifles into those Union soldiers before pulling the trigger. So don't fire your guns until you feel your gun touch the chest or the breast of a Union soldier and pull the trigger. There aren't enough Confederates here. Reinforcements from the brigade, from Laws Alabama Brigade, members of the 4th Alabama, the 44th Alabama, the 47th Alabama, have been pulled back from the valley across the tip of Lookout Mountain back into Chattanooga Valley. So Oates is out here virtually alone with some members of the 4th Alabama. It's going to be chaos. Oates is going to be wounded, he's going to be shot in the thigh, he's going to fall, he's going to be brought back to a house to convalesce to get help, medical attention. The 15th Alabama is going to break down, they're going to fall back down Browns Ferry Road, which is the road that heads just to the south of here, toward the base of Lookout Mountain as Hazen's men begin to dig in on the ridge tops and those pontoon boats are sent back across the river to ferry the rest of Hazen's brigade over here and then those pontoon boats will be lashed together to create that pontoon bridge. Union soldiers will begin flooding over to this side of the Tennessee River to strengthen that beachhead, to strengthen this ferry crossing and then to begin the process of opening up the supply line that will assist those beleaguered and on the verge of starving Union soldiers down here in the city of Chattanooga. So this is the first step of the breakout of opening that supply line that will eventually become known as the Cracker Line. The next day on October the 28th, there's going to be a conference up on Lookout Mountain behind me on a place called Sunset Rock as General James Longstreet and the Confederate commander of the Army of Tennessee meet and they will strategize how to push the Union Army back 
and stop this supply line from being opened up. And so we'll see you tomorrow on October 28th on Sunset Rock on Lookout Mountain. See you then.